Fat ones, skinny ones, short ones, tall ones, round ones, square ones, bright ones, white ones, pointy ones, stripes, checks, colors galore, bumpy ones, smooth ones, itsy bitsy ones, and just plain weird ones. Are there any shapes mollusks haven't tried? Why are there so many beautiful shapes and colors? Let's look at some shells and see what they can tell us about the animals that make the shells. Mollusks have been evolving for over 500 million years. They live today in almost every environment, in the oceans, from the beach to the deepest trenches, in trees, in fresh water, even in the desert. They are found on every continent. Yes, even in Antarctica. It's estimated that there may be more than 70,000 species with more being discovered every year. There are seven classes of mollusks, but let's just look at the types that you are likely to find on Sanibel or in perhaps shell shops. Gastropods, also called snails, are single-shelled mollusks and the most common. It is estimated that today there are over 55,000 different species living in every habitat. Bivalves are the next most common group. They have a shell divided into two hinged parts called valves. You can find them in marine and freshwater environments. There are about 10,000 different species, many of which are collected or farmed as a seafood delicacy. Scaphopods, or tusk shells, are small but unique. There are only about 1,000 species worldwide and only six species on Sanibel. If you practice an exceptional Sanibel stoop, you're likely to find tusk shells right at the water's edge at low tide. You're not likely to see any cephalopods on Sanibel, except after a storm when the local pygmy octopus might be thrown up on the beach. You are more likely to see an octopus if you visit the Shell Museum's new aquarium on Sanibel. Why so many shapes? Let's look at two common but very different Sanibel shells, the lettered olive and the lace murex. The lettered olive is smooth, bullet-shaped, and shiny. The lace murex is covered with ridges, varices, and ruffles. The lettered olive has a long, narrow opening called an aperture that makes it harder for a predator to reach the animal inside. The lettered olive has only one way to protect itself, and that's to hide. It stays burrowed in the sand most of the day, with just its siphon sticking up into the water to catch the scent of prey. At night, it comes up to feed on the small crustaceans and bivalves. The mantle is the portion of the animal that secretes the materials to create the shell, and in this olive, it can cover the entire shell and keep it shiny. The lettered olive's color is perfect camouflage, but that doesn't protect it from the genonia that finds olives delicious. Now look at our lace murex. All this sculpture would make it difficult for the animal to burrow into the sand to protect itself, but it has other defenses. The sculpture helps to reinforce the strength of the shell. The ruffle on top of the shell is called a varex. It makes the animal larger, and it could make for an uncomfortable mouthful for a hungry fish. The varex also makes it harder for shell-crushing stone crab to break into the shell. The murex often dines on bivalves, but two can play the game. The Florida spiny jewel box has hollow spines, and the Atlantic thorny oyster sports formidable spines. The ultimate spiny shell is probably the murex pectin, found in Indo-Pacific oceans. Those spines would make most predators think twice about taking a bite, so there's little need to burrow in the sand for protection. Bivalves often burrow too. For example, you often see just the siphons of cockle sticking out of the sand. They filter water for food, and it makes sense to stay hidden. This Atlantic giant cockle is totally hidden except for its siphon. The Florida prickly cockle can burrow as well. It has short scales that point upward, making it harder to pull the shell out of the sand. Some mollusks have an operculum on the top of their foot, often called a trap door. They can withdraw into the shell and close the door behind them. The hard operculum of this chestnut turban makes it harder for a predator to crack into the shell. It also keeps the animal moist if it's stranded on the beach for a few hours at low tide. Another approach is to grow so-called teeth. Cowries hide under rocks during the day and feed at night. They don't have an operculum, but their aperture is narrow and the lip is strong with reinforcing teeth. Many land snails have an array of teeth around the aperture that strengthens the shell. Cone snails have strong, heavy shells to protect against predators. They all produce toxins to paralyze the worms, small fish, and other mollusks they eat. A crab can still break into their shell. This alphabet cone shows the marks of breakage, but it survived and continued to grow. 
Carrier shells protect themselves by attaching carefully selected items. The carrier shell you'll find on Sanibel prefers small bits of rocks and shell. It glues the rocks with its mantle as it expands its shell. The rocks create pointy structures that function like false spines to help defend the animal against predators. The rocks may also camouflage the shell. Mollusks have developed a wide range of reproductive strategies. Many species, such as the lightning whelk and true tulip, have both male and female sexes with internal fertilization. In many species, the female is much larger than the male. They often lay egg cases that contain miniature versions of the adult shell. But other species have a different approach. Slipper shells all begin as males, and as they grow larger, they can change to female. You'll often see a stack of them with the smallest ones, the males, on top of the larger females. Most land snails and some marine species are hermaphrodites. They have both male and female organs. They still favor having sex to mix up their genes, and both snails and the couple will produce eggs. A few species go it alone and self-fertilize, called parthenogenesis. This is helpful where populations are scattered and it's hard to find a mate. Many bivalves have a different problem. They are attached in one place, so they can't go looking for a mate. Their solution is to reproduce by mass spawning. Eggs and sperm are released into the water at the same time by large numbers of adults, usually in the spring when there is more plankton for the larvae to feed on. They rely on the water currents to mix egg and sperm randomly. Some eggs will be fertilized and develop into embryos, then larvae, then ultimately adult mollusks. Many of us love to eat clams and mussels, but what do those mollusks eat? And who eats them? Just about everyone, it seems. Almost everyone has a predator they have to watch out for. It's a dangerous world for the mollusks. Many gastropods are herbivores, including fighting conchs, chestnut turbans, and the keyhole limpets. They mostly eat algae. Bivalves typically filter water, so their primary food is suspended microscopic plants called microalgae. There are lots of carnivores on Sanibel. If you've seen holes in shells, you've probably seen the result of one of these two predators. Both the shark eye and the apple murex have a radula that can rasp a hole in a shell. The radula is like a tongue with thousands of tiny teeth. The shark eye also secretes acid to help bore the hole. This group of docinias and the venus were successfully drilled, but it takes a long time to drill a hole. Shark eye snails drill about one millimeter a day, and it can take a murex a week to drill through, depending on the thickness of the shell. During that time, the snail is vulnerable to other carnivores, and they have to abandon its meal if another predator approaches. It's not unusual to see a shark eye with a hole in it, probably from another shark eye. Cannibalism isn't uncommon. This shark eye was attacked twice, but managed to get away both times. The top predator is the horse conch, which can grow to be two feet long. It surrounds its prey with a powerful foot and probably secretes substances to relax the animal. Here it is eating a lightning whelk, which is also a carnivore, and eats mostly bivalves. Even birds like to eat mollusks. If a cockle is stranded on the beach, a seagull may pick it up, fly high into the air, and drop it to try to break its shell. Sea stars are echinoderms, not mollusks, but they often eat mollusks, especially bivalves. They have a unique approach to dining. They can extend their stomach out through their mouth and engulf their prey. They then insert digestive enzymes to digest their prey. A common sea star in Sanibel is the nine-armed sea star. But some mollusks get back at them. The animals in the family Eulimidae are all parasites on sea stars and sea urchins. They attach themselves firmly and lap up body fluids. These Eulimids tend to be smooth and glassy, perhaps to keep their host from noticing their presence. They are also very small. These two examples are less than three millimeters long, about one-tenth of an inch. Thankfully, there are snails that think carrion is a delicacy and will quickly dispatch any dead fish or other animal in the water. These nasarids can smell dinner from a distance and descend on it in great numbers. Bivalves help keep our oceans sparkling clean. They filter water to pick out tiny bits of food. Many of them end up on our dinner plate too. Humans love seafood. Our favorites include oysters, clams, scallops, and fancy French escargot. 
So which is the predator and which is the prey? Match the predator on the left to the most common prey on the right. Did you make the same matches that we did? The brown limit is a parasite on the sea star. The horse conch eats the tulip. The shark eye drills a hole in the venus clam. And the lightning whelk eats the southern quahog clam. We all love shells because of their beautiful shapes, but also their striking colors and patterns. Shells tend to be more intensely colored in tropical waters than in polar regions. We know a little about how mollusks incorporate pigments into their shells, but we don't really know why. Maybe you'll be the person to figure this out. Mother of Pearl, also known as nacre, is the same calcium carbonate material as the rest of the shell, but in a structure that reflects light differently. Abalone and pearl oysters are great examples of shells that are rough on the outside with iridescent mother of pearl inside. Pearls are made of the same material. They're the only gemstone made by an animal. On Sanibel, turn over a pen shell, which is often a plain brown on the outside, and you'll see beautiful mother of pearl on the inside. Most land snails are brown, which may camouflage them, but some are vividly colored. These are Florida liguus, a protected and endangered species that live in trees. While shells are often colorful, we're missing half the story if we don't also look at the colors of the animal. In some species, the live animal is actually more dramatically colored than the shell. The horse conch, for example, is a brilliant orange. While its shell can have attractive muted stripes and sculpture, it is comparatively colorless. Similarly, this lightning whelk has gorgeous markings on the shell, but the live animal is surprisingly pure black. Cowries tend to have beautiful shiny shells. Their mantle, which creates the shell, reaches all the way around the shell and keeps it shiny. In many cases, this mantle is equally spectacular. We don't have a lot of cowrie species near Sanibel, but let's look at some of those found in the tropics. The tiger cowrie is a very popular shell, with its speckled shell that can be found with a wide variety of patterns. The animal has a magnificent mantle. The protuberances on the mantle are called papillae and may help to camouflage the animal and might have a role in respiration. The chocolate banded cowrie is a beautiful shiny shell found in the Indo-Pacific. The live animal has a stunning black mantle flecked with white and covered with large cylindrical papillae. Again, this mantle may help the animal look more like tufts of algae or other less appetizing sea life. Little egg cowries are not actually in the cowrie family. Commonly, they have a fairly simple white shell. Here are some little egg cowries displaying a variety of brilliantly colored polka dots. These and the little papillae may help to camouflage them against the leather coral polyps that they eat. The red simnia from the eastern Pacific lives on red gorgonian sea fans. Its shell is a shade of coral red. The animal also takes its red color and mottled pattern from the soft coral it lives on. This coloration may help it blend into its coral habitat. Coming back to the Caribbean, consider the flamingo tongue. The shell is a plain light orange or white, but the animal is covered with flamboyant geometric dots that mimic the pattern of the gorgonian soft corals on which they feed. The gaudy natica is one of Sanibel's prettiest and most coveted shells, but the live animal is equally colorful, with a copper and white pattern all over the mantle. We've just scratched the surface of fascinating details about mollusks on Sanibel and around the world. The extensive diversity of shape, variety of reproductive approaches, assorted diets, and the rainbow of colors of the shells and the animals. Happy shelling! Mm -hmm.